Hello and welcome to another episode of Talk of Him Friends. We are so excited to have you join us for a very special conversation. We get the the double whammy of magic today. <laughs> double Wilcox whammy. Oh, the yeah. Wilcox brothers. Yes. <laughs> we are so grateful to have Brother Brad back. This Thank is your you. second time here in the studio. But this time you brought your brother Roger with us. Yes. Good and we're here. so grateful to have this conversation with both of you. So for those of you that may be wondering a little bit backstory on on what the Wilcoxes are all about, why don't we have you introduce yourself? We'll start with you, Brad. We grew up in a family of four boys, no girls. Our dad's motto was, there's no women's work, there's no men's work, there's just work. <laughs> and we do it, and we do it together. And we did. And we did. <laughs> he, he taught us to work. That's good husband training. Yeah, right it was great husband training. But uh, Roger's my, old, my oldest brother, Wayne, and his wife are serving right now on a mission in Portugal in the oh, temple. Oh, they are? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, then Roger and his wife just got back yeah. from a mission to Spokane. Spokane. Washington. Wonderful. Yeah. And then Debbie and I uh, are haven't served yet as a couple, but we did serve as mission president and companion in Chile. And then my younger brother, Chris, and his wife, Cheryl, live locally as well. So it's fun. And we, you're currently serving, for those that don't know, I don't know yeah, who I doesn't know. I served but... in the Young Men General Presidency. So my life is filled right now with recruiting FSY counselors <laughs> and getting <laughs> really? FSY that, youth recruited. I wondered what you did. You bet. <laughs> That's what my life is filled with. And <laughs> we're excited. Last year went really well. It did. I've heard yeah. so many good things from youth that were on the fence. Yeah. No, Not sure they wanted to do it. Same, same with us uh, in the seminaries and institutes. We've, we were surprised to hear how many kids came back and were like, wow, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. This, yeah. this year in, in United States and Canada, we're expecting 150,000. That's crazy. Just in United States and Canada. So it's going to be huge. But that fills a lot of my time. And then I'm also teaching at BYU. Uh, Debbie and I have four kids, and we've got nine grandkids. Oh man. Jealous. And we're we're so grateful that you have brought like your past and your current stewardships and all that you have experienced. You have a new book that you worked on together, but I have it right here. Yeah. But before we'll be we go there, about it in a moment. There's a little Spoiler fun alert. fact that involves Ethiopia that I think before we move on yeah. about the Wilcoxes, can you talk about your connection with Ethiopia? Roger. Um <clears throat> my um my father um, accepted an assignment from USAID uh, to go over to Ethiopia and to help with the educational system over there okay. to teach teachers how to be teachers um, there in the country. And so uh, we left. I, I, I was there between the ages of seven and ten. Yeah, I came you home were there when I was about, seven. So. Yeah, you were there about five to seven, yeah. the ages that, for you. And uh, so it was a marvelous experience, wonderful, that we had. And um, I was baptized over there. Wow. And that's part in the book uh, with that. But uh, yeah, it was a river flowing there and hippos and crocodiles. And no, he wasn't and, baptized uh, with the crocodiles. No, no, not <laughs> in the river, but in a bathhouse that was real close to the river at a, a swimming place called Soda Ray. Well, the saints so, on that continent are amazing. Yeah. John has a son serving there. My son served in Zimbabwe, so. Yeah. Yeah, where's your son serving? My son's in Botswana. Oh, yeah. Man. Well, I just had the chance to go back. Um, I'm the first one in our family to go back to Ethiopia, and I had the chance to do an assignment for the, the children and youth training. Yeah. And it took me to uh, Kenya and to Uganda and to Ethiopia. Wow. And I'll tell you, it was really special to be there to be in a chapel. When we were there, the church wasn't yeah. even officially established. Well, we yeah. had our own little branch of other members who had come on that assignment. Right. And so we had a branch of about 40 or 50 members. And I remember going to church in the homes and and um, some of the other little things that way. But, wow. but we really didn't proselyte. We really weren't in a position to do that. Right. Um, but yeah, when Brad went back and found that first ward or two that was established, because oh, now there's circle, now there's right? two chapels in the country, and it was neat to be able to be in both chapels and to be working with the members and the missionaries. And mm -hmm. the missionaries are now learning Amharic. Do you remember any words? Mm -hmm. 
Some. Oh, I know. I remember <laughs> dog, Busha. I remember Tinnish, little. Yeah. I mean, we, we learned a few words, but the yeah. missionaries yeah. now, Tukul. they're learning. Yeah. Tuko, Shama. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, Tenastaling. Yeah. <laughs> I feel left out. I, I, don't, I don't know any of you. <laughs> we, I don't know. The, it's called Amharic, and right. now the missionaries are actually learning the language, mm. and that's leading to a lot of a lot more success because mm -hmm. they're able to reach people in their own language now. So that's a recent yeah. thing that they're they, so very they ha recent. we haven't been sending yeah. missionaries there's over there. There's only with that been a mission language. in Ethiopia. Well the first mission president is just finishing his three oh, years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Cameron didn't learn Shona for Zimbabwe because not every word in the gospel is a sh there's a Shona word. So the same word for the spirit and the adversary or Satan is the same word in Shona. So that would be confusing if <laughs> missionaries were teaching yeah, yeah. Um, go the gospel yeah. in that way. But he, it does help, I think, connect with, with the people to really understand. And he yeah. picked it up. But what a cool, fun background connection and an opportunity for you to go full circle and come we, back. We learned so many wonderful things from that experience. So. I mean, I look back and I just think mm -hmm. even simple things like, you know, most kids complain about school lunch. We never complained about school mm -hmm. lunch. We were thrilled to have school lunch. <laughs> and most kids complain about books and homework. Yeah, yeah. And we came from a country where we realized what a blessing it was yeah. to, to have, have an book. education yeah. and to have books. Yeah. And to witness our parents serve the way they did. They were always willing to give a little bit and help uh, individuals, little children and others that were uh, struggling and, and suffering and, and things. And, and so we always learned we could turn to our parents to, to be able to help mm. situations that we felt what like What a blessing to, to, at such a young age, to sort of be heightened in your awareness of those things. And the most, so many most people kids, just, we just never oh, had that. Yeah. But we came home having seen real suffering, real starvation, yeah. real uh, struggles. And so we did come home counting blessings in That's ways cool. that I don't think a lot of kids do. And what a great foundation for what yeah. you both have gone on to do mm -hmm. in your individual stewardships. And probably a perfect segue into... Well, I think we missed Roger. Yeah, yeah, you better Roger, give a little Roger, introduction. A little, oh. uh, uh, my name is Roger Wilcox. I'm <laughs> Brad's older brother. See, this is why and, I'm uh, grateful <laughs> to have a co-host. <laughs> we could go and, off the rails uh, at any moment, so... Um, I uh, have a marvelous, wonderful wife named Moana. She's in studio and, with us. We yeah, welcome her. Yeah, and uh, f five wonderful kids and uh, fourteen marvelous grandkids. Oh, so enjoy the family. Five, and, Brad. And I love know. To, <laughs> love to yeah, associate and be part of that. The family we sent her around that, and we just love it. Um, but as we mentioned before, I'm now retired. I, I taught in the church educational system, yeah. seminary and institutes for 35 years. Wow. And um, kind of had your job. Totally, totally enjoyed it. Thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. And uh, what area were you in church education? Oh, uh, mostly in the Utah Valley, uh, Salt Lake area. Okay. I started out in Evanston, Wyoming. Oh, you did? And so I was up there for the a scenic bit. Evanston, Wyoming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got my I got my uh, doctorate at University of Wyoming. So they're a little cowboy yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. In both University of, us. of Wyoming. You bet. And yeah. the show's huge up in Wyoming. So all the Wyoming fans <laughs> so, are happy yes. to get a shout out. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Let's go Wyoming. But yeah, we, you know, I've just enjoyed that experience of all different kinds of situations. And, and many, many, many students, and, and I, the friendships and the, the love that was there, uh, very much so. It's funny because we, we teach a lot alike when we're yeah, speaking. Yeah, a lot of my students teaching. will say, you sound a lot like Brad. <laughs> and that's you what, look a little bit like His Brad. students will come up to me and they'll say, you sound just like your brother. <laughs> when you guys are teaching, you're like identical because we've got the same mannerisms. That's and we've cool. got the same. funny how that works. Yeah, yeah. so it's pretty funny. <laughs> he, he got the looks and I got the brain. <laughs> If you call this looks, you are really going blind. <laughs> that was good. Well, um, thank you for that, for those intros. And it's, uh, we're just so grateful to have you with us. And we're grateful to highlight this book. And the book uh, that uh, both Brad and Roger have written is called Blessed Are Ye. And, and this is the first time we've seen it. Yeah, so yeah. So this surprise. is exciting it to see exciting, that right? cover. It's mine. I think they spelled um, my name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> But um, 
So, so tell me how accurate I am in my one sentence summary of the book. You and can then, read it right off the, no, the no, subtitle. No, no, I'm going to try. I'm, All right. I'm going to try. So anyway, we take the Beatitudes, eight Beatitudes to, to be exact, from the Sermon on the Mount, and we show how those are blueprints or the constitution to living a better life, especially in terms of accessing deeper, deeper sort of levels of healing uh, provided through Jesus Christ's grace and atonement. Yeah, I think you've done a nice job of summarizing it. We actually also introduced the Beatitudes that were given at the Sermon at the Temple in the right. Book of Mormon. There's two Beatitudes in the, in the Book of Mormon that are not found in the Bible. And by uh, looking closely at those Beatitudes, you realize that that the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes themselves, were directed to an audience that are a covenant people audience. Um, president Nelson, when he started uh, as the president of the church, uh, he coined the phrase covenant path. And, and in a way, that's what the Beatitudes mm -hmm. and the Sermon on the Mount do. Yeah. They, they take you on that covenant path. And that's what we've done in this book is we, we show and we're trying to explore how the Beatitudes outline, if you will, that path uh, through the covenants, through the ordinances, and then um, use the attributes that we need to have for exaltation. Yeah. So people say, all right, I know the I know the atonement's important, yeah. but how do I apply it? Yeah. Uh, or I know grace is a real power, yeah. but how do I access it? And that's what we've tried to show is that perhaps Jesus was teaching in the Beatitudes the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, yeah. the doctrine of Christ, right. the covenants of the temple. Perhaps he, the, he wasn't just giving good advice. Like, nice ethics lesson for everybody on the planet. No. If we consider the context, as Roger was saying, then he's speaking to members of the church. Or those who are soon to be, or desire yeah, yeah, to be members. Those who are following. Those who are enter coming, in, and who come into, into the, the covenant, covenant path. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you start realizing mm. that he's, he's outlining some steps for us. He's outlining the how. Mm -hmm. How do we apply his atonement? How do we access his grace? We're able to see that he's doing much more than just saying, be nice and play nicely with each other. Mm. And I like the emphasis on becoming, yeah. right? Yeah. Developing the attributes of Jesus Christ. And we've all seen, you know, various iterations of the Beatitudes, but I remember, it was probably 20 years ago in some early training, you know, in my seminary career where they showed how they could be viewed as, and I think, I, I read this somewhere in your book, you just tipped your hat to it, I know how they can be progressive, you know, one mm. poor, Build. mourning, yeah. meek, you know, it, like, they kind of build on teachers, each other. Yeah, I've had teachers that have said, oh, these are like the steps of repentance, or right, I've had other right, teachers right. say, oh, this relates to the gifts of the Spirit. And I or guess, they're just simply characteristics yeah, or whatever. Yeah, attributes of Christ. Attributes yeah. or wh whatever that Christ is promoting, but there seems to be no order to it or no right. context yeah. to it all. Yeah. And that's why the Book of Mormon account is so vital. It, it gives context to the entire thing and, and what we're trying to become, yeah. that perfection and that exalted state, uh, if you will. Love um, it. You know, in fact, exalted becomes an interesting word when you look at blessed are thou. If you look at the, at the roots of the word, sometimes people will say it means uh, fortunate or yeah, happy. To be happy, blessed. But if you look at the Hebrew roots, it can actually mean holy or exalted. Mm. So when Christ is saying, you know, hey, blessed, blessed art thou. He's saying exalted are they awesome. who, who do these things do develop or learn these attributes. to do these things. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we really do have to clarify that we're not saying this is the right, answer or what Jesus was teaching. Mm. But I think the fact that we've been able to make some connections that go beyond some of the connections that others have made, it kind of invites readers to say, fine, make your own connections. Yeah. And that's the beauty of scripture study. Mm -hmm. 
is that somebody else can come along and say, well, I'm seeing connections with something more. And so if this book does nothing more than invite readers to start looking for some of their own yeah. connections, right. then we'll feel like it succeeded. Well, and I feel like the strong case is being made that it helps when we do, as Roger said, a connection between covenant making and keeping and what Christ taught, right? And so when you're saying that through the making and keeping of covenants, we become and we take on these attributes, then the teaching isn't just like, oh, that was a really great sermon or that was a really great TED talk, right? That, that invites the reader to have a change experience. Mm. And so when we connect it to the ongoing restoration and the covenant keeping that we're all engaged in, then I think it is a different flavor right. or perspective or lens mm. on something that has been taught and analyzed how many other times. And unfortunately, you as a teacher would know uh, in that regard, but unfortunately, the curriculum does not offer much time right. uh, to go into depth mm -hmm. this could with be some a, of these This things. could be a year course and of so, study. Right. Yeah. You could teach a lesson on each beatitude right. and still not right. get to the depth. Right. Um, and so, obviously, that's a struggle. Uh, how do we capture all this? Yeah. And, um, and so that was one of the reasons we, we teamed together to put this together was in hopes that for those who are interested, they could go a little bit deeper into what's happening than just a, a casual few minutes of discussion. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, in, in <clears throat> Sunday school curriculum or in Come Follow Me curriculum, you might get a, a one week on the Sermon on the Mount, which is the sermon entirely. And just the Beatitudes <laughs> right. uh, often get overlooked. Yeah. Uh, I've heard many talks and lessons on the Sermon on the Mount that skip right over the Beatitudes mm -hmm. and go right into some of the other parts of the sermon, which are so important. Well, but well, the, important, the Beatitudes are as well. Yeah, it, just a thought on my mind, you know, talking about importance, when you add the two Beatitudes that are not in the Bible to the eight that are, you now have 10 Beatitudes. Yeah. Interesting, 10 commandments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're parallel, both given on a mount. 10 on the lower both, law. Right. Given from a mountain. 10 from the higher law. Given on a mount. Yeah. And so there's parallel, there's similarity oh, there. So much. That, but unfortunately, I'm not sure they get the same attention, right. if you will. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and that's sort of what we're hoping is we can bring more attention to the higher law beatitudes. Yeah. So John and I have worked on one book together, and, and I'm, I've worked on a number on my own, so, so have you. And John's working on one on his own. Is that fair to give that news? It's breaking I'm here right now. I'm an aspiring author. <laughs> That's great. It and may we're, never happen. So what's your book okay. called? Wilcox's <laughs> We're Up in the Night. <laughs> A secret biography. <laughs> of so, and, and we're currently working on, uh, on another project together. What was it like, just like from an author perspective, your brothers, you're working on this project together. What, what was the idea behind doing it together? Well, and, and and how was that experience? Over the years, as I taught, I would learn more things. And I like to share things with Brad. You know, we're, we're close. I do too, and, so we share and, that. You know, <laughs> so I'd share things with that, him, and he would share things with me. And, okay, that was fun. That was nice. And we, But after a while, we started realizing that maybe there's something more to mm -hmm. this. And, and maybe we ought to do something with it, but we just never got around to it because I was busy, he was busy. Now, when you're and, teaching, <clears> it's, you know, it's hard just, to find time to write. We just never really got around to it. But then uh, I retired. Um, my wife and I served a mission, and um, Brad came up and spoke at, at our mission. Oh, well, that was a lot of fun. And, and so he stayed with us for a few days. And, and while we were together, we started talking, thinking, well, you know, why not? Why can't we make this happen now? And so um, I started writing more of what I had. He started writing more of what he had. Then we'd sit down and 
share and compile and and um, we did that a few times until we started coming up with something and, and then of course the final touch is always Brad's magic um, that he puts onto it. No, the, the final end. touch is an <laughs> editor's <laughs> magic. It's true. We, we love our editor. We all know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but you know, it really was interesting because by doing this together, then we were both teaching from our personal experience. Mm -hmm. And so the book is filled with personal experiences um, that are coming from from his life, from my life, from the lives of those we love. Uh, we just were recording some of the book for the audio book, and my son came in and recorded a little piece, and then my wife came in and recorded a little piece because we're just sharing so much of our life experiences. And, uh, and I think that's what makes teaching, that's what makes reading something that people can connect to is when you're not just sharing ideas, but you're right. sharing right. experiences from your, from your heart. And the book is full of those. And the fact that, you know, as he would write about his experiences, I remember living that. Yeah. I remember, you know, going through that. And then similarly, when I would write, then he would say, yeah, I remember when that was happening. That's kind of cool to remember. I've had a similar experience just as I'm trying to write now, I'm, I'm trying to draw from past experiences. And in the process of doing that, you do, you sort of reprocess them, reprocess them, right? And then you almost relive them. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a sacred thing. It's become very sacred for me. Uh, with that in mind, um, I, I love the power of experiences. And I, we love this connection that you have be in the book between covenants and the Beatitudes. Can you, do you mind sharing with the reader maybe some examples from the book of experiences you've had with your covenants? Well, the one, the one chapter talks about being poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're poor, if you're, if you're poor in, if you're a poor athlete, then it means that you're lacking skills. Mm -hmm. If you're poor financially, then you're lacking money. And if your spirit is poor, then your spirit is recognizing that you're very unlike Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to say, you know, what lack I yet, and thy will be done. Mm -hmm. as, the humility involved yes, with that. Yeah, as you're choosing Jesus as a mentor to help you so that you're not so poor in mm -hmm. spirit. This kind of poor in spirit attitude, this humility, to be able to say, look, I will do thy will. And in that chapter, we share an experience from Rogers growing up that's very tender for our family, very tender. And uh, I don't know, but uh, maybe you should share a little of that just right here. Mm, I don't know about the details. Uh, they'll, at least part of things give, will give be us in the book. Yeah, give us a per teaser. Se, but but um, from about ages 14 through 17, I... I succumbed to the idea of popularity or the idea of uh, having friends, certain friends, and I sacrificed some of the morals and values that uh, our parents taught. <clears throat> Basically, I, I left the path, left the church in that way, sense for a few years, and I caused a lot of problems um, for my for family included. and. Um, <clears throat> and so we we shared about um, how um, my dad finally things came to a head, and my dad finally said, "If uh, if if you can't change, then I'm going to have to send you away and not have you live here because you're hurting our family. You're you're destroying your mother and and hurting your your younger brothers." And uh, that was, you know, that was a real moment for me. And he, he invited me to come to church that day. And uh, so I went with my long hair and, and all the other things that were involved. And um, knowing that I was not in a position to be cast out from the house yet, uh, I was still 17 and still in high school. And, um, and, when I was in that preschorm, um, the Spirit touched me uh, deeply um, when a bishop that I, I did
did not know at that time, but he bore his testimony and it just touched me deeply. And I tried to run away and get away from it, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I came back and talked with him. And after a couple of hours of letting things out, if you will, <clears throat> and the feel feelings and the depths that we had, um, he said, it seems to me, um, he called me rock. Everybody called me rock back then. I, I did weights and did other things. And I, I think was, I, I would love to call I, you rock. I know. <laughs> now I'm a boulder, great, but I, a great, I was a rock <laughs> man. But, uh, boulder. But uh, he said, rock, it seems to me that you need, you need to know that God loves you. And that, um, you know, that the gospel is true. And I immediately shied back and said, the Lord would never, if there is a God, he would never answer my prayers after all the things I've done. And he put his finger in my face and said, no, I promise you in the name of Jesus Christ that if you will offer up sincere prayer, he will answer your prayer. And you will know in an undeniable way. And it was like in the rock concerts and everything, when the lights start flicking in the dark, all of a sudden I had hope. Maybe I could get out of this hell that I had cornered myself in due to misuse of many things. And... Uh, so on the way home, I knelt in a cherry orchard. It became my sacred grove. And I received wonderful answers through the Spirit that he indeed loves me, knows who I am, and cares, and that the gospel is true. <clears throat> so I went home, and the the episode that I was talking about with my father happened the night before mm. where he said, if you don't come home mm. by midnight, then you're out of here. I'm going to lock the door. He said, I'm, I'm going to lock, lock the, the door, door and you're no longer welcome. And in my teenage pride, I went and jumped in my vehicle and said, I'm out of here, you know. Um, but then I came back around to... Mm. 2 or 2.30, and the door was unlocked. I decided I would check it out because as I was driving around and doing things after I dropped my friends off, I realized that I was not as independent as I could be and should be and that I'd have a lot of problems if I didn't have a home to be in. And so I decided I'd go and check, and the door was open. So I went in downstairs, went went to my room, and, and that was the next morning on Sunday when my dad came in and said, you're ruining our family, things have got to change. And I decided, well, you're right. I, uh, at least until I graduate, I'll, I'll try to do better. And so that's why I went to church. And my dad didn't know that things would happen because that Sunday night I, I went back and went into our, our house and... Uh, it was dark. It was way past sundown. I had been in the cherry orchard for hours. And they hadn't seen me all day, and so they didn't know where I was. And my my mom was at the dining room table with her head in her hands, and uh, just saying over and over, "We've lost our son. We've lost our son." And I remember standing there in the dark, watching. My dad was on the phone, trying to call around to find out where I was. And uh, I saw them for the first time as not enemies, mm. or people who hate me, or that I should hate them. I mm. saw them for what they were, and I was so touched. And So I stepped out into the room, and they saw me, and they stood up. And I said, Mom, Dad, the gospel's true, isn't it? And it shocked them. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't fall over right yeah. there. And my dad finally found the words, and he said, yes, it is. The gospel is true. 
And uh, so we hugged and talked for a little bit. And then the first thing I did was I said, Mom, will you give me a haircut? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, that's that's a that's a true token of a covenant about to be <laughs> well, made there. Long hair was a sign of rebellion. Right, and I, right, I right, right. Decided I don't. Right, I, there's sure. nothing to rebel against anymore. Yeah. And so, I, you know, how happy was she to give that haircut? I wonder. Oh, uh, she, she she was thrilled, and <laughs> it was it was wonderful to feel like I was part of the family again. And it was a good turning point. But the interesting thing is that what does that have to do with being poor in spirit? It wasn't till years later right. that Roger found out that my dad had locked the door. Mm -hmm. he, he had locked he it. He had locked it. And he was... And then he wrestled with himself because my, my dad was a teacher, man. He knew how to discipline teenagers and he knew... Well, that's what he taught up at the school. He, if he knew that discipline. if he didn't... if. If he said something and didn't go through with it, the then boundary. it was over, yeah. yeah. And so it was so interesting when when he finally said, after, he just wrestled with the Spirit because the Spirit kept saying, go unlock the door. And he kept saying, if I do, he'll never believe me. And But he finally went and unlocked it. He said these words, thy will be done. Mm. And he unlocked the door. And that was a turning point wow. for our whole family. Beautiful. And so, you know, we shared that in this chapter about being poor in spirit because I felt like that was such a great example of my father mm -hmm. yeah. being poor in spirit and being willing not just to say, thy will be done, but to do it, even when it went against everything that he knew, everything that he'd ever taught. But he followed that spirit, and, and if Roger had come home and found that door locked, what would have been different? Yeah. What a tender story. Yeah. And John has shared on the show his own yeah. similar journey. Yeah. What is it about seminary teachers? <laughs> Come on. Because it, it allows you to sucker and it teach really, and I, I reach. would I would hope that having gone through similar things, if we don't come out of it more empathic, more mm -hmm. charitable, more forgiving, more uh, you know, clear in our vision of others, then what in the world was it for? Right. And I just love the, the this beautiful concept of, you know, your father mm -hmm. fighting against his natural inclinations, his wanting journey. to be like the father. And the, the father says to your father, right. if you want to be like me, I never lock the door. Unlock that door. And that's a truth that resonates deeply with me, a God who never locks the door. Yeah. And so that's oh, pretty that's, cool. That's what... You know, that's what we wanted to be able to share were, were these kind of experiences that have made such a difference in our lives that, that then can illustrate not just what the, the Beatitudes are, but how they help us connect to Christ, connect to His grace, and the changes that can happen yeah. because of that. Well, and I, I mean, it's why we do this show. There's families all over the world that are having that experience. Yeah. Either it's the parents crying at the kitchen table or deciding where the boundary is and where's the line and what cost is it taking on the whole family or the teenager that's wrestling or the young adult that's wrestling that has already felt like they've made so many changes that there's no way. I mean, what a tender right. teaching, Roger, for your bishop to declare and testify in the name of Christ that um, you hadn't fallen too far from the love and grace that Christ has to offer. That's reality. That's what families are wrestling with. And, and if we don't take and make a bridge between what the scriptures are teaching, what the Savior is teaching in the Beatitudes, and apply it to our lives, that's the whole reason why we do this show, mm -hmm. right? To make that bridge, to have these conversations so that people see their real life in the scriptures. That good bishop was Roger's best man <gasps> at his wedding. Oh, yeah, I, I, after I came back to the uh, to the church, if you will, I I became very close with him, and and um, yeah, yeah, I, he, I invited him to be my best man at our wedding. That's awesome. And you know what's interesting? Just this morning, I was out at Holdman Studios. He's doing the stained glass windows for the new oh, yeah. Orem Temple. Yes. And he showed me some of the windows, and the theme is cherry blossoms and cherry orchards. Oh. Wow. 
And I sat there and looked at these windows that are going to be in a temple that's not all that far from the cherry orchard where Whoa. you knelt and prayed. And I thought, there's this temple that's with cool, these man. cherry blossoms and these cherries. And and it's not all that far from where you had that Your experience. sacred grove, yeah. yeah. Shout out to Tom and Gail, oh, good yeah. friends of mine. I love them. Um, can we pull another thing from the book? In yeah. chapter one, you talk about um, being seeing a famous singer in the airport. And I, I guess I would just like to ask, what do you feel helps foster your faith in a society where fame is celebrated, but faith isn't? Following Jesus, um, sustaining a prophet, keeping covenants, those are not attributes right now that you get likes on social media for. Both of you, what, what comes to mind as you think about this day and age and, and this idea of the power of fostering our faith in Christ when the world is obviously not always going to celebrate that. You know, the first beatitude in the Book of Mormon is, Blessed are ye if ye have faith in me, and if ye follow the twelve that I have right. chosen for you. Act on that. And so it's not just a matter of having faith in Christ, but it's having faith in His church and faith mm. in His leaders. leaders. And that the experience I share was when I was coming out of the Salt Lake Airport and some I won't say the singer's name because everybody here will say, oh, that was a while ago. <laughs> I know, but I really did want to know when I was reading the It was book. Kenny Rogers. Oh, good. That's Kenny Rogers awesome. was okay, showing us. Like everybody in the airport knew who Kenny Rogers was. Of course. He's walking down the airport, and everybody's trying to catch a, 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 a picture of Kenny Rogers. And, yeah. and I, I went to the lady at the desk because there was so much hubbub. I said, what's going on? She says, Kenny Rogers, Kenny Rogers, like she couldn't even breathe. <laughs> she was so excited. And uh, and I thought, well, that's great. I love Kenny Rogers. He's a great singer. In the choir in heaven, he's going to have a solo. Uh, you know, he, or maybe well, he and Dolly Parton. A that's lot what I was going to say. I'm, I'm, I'm asking for a duo with Dolly and Kenny. But, but it was interesting for me because I saw the whole airport just yeah. coming unglued because this famous singer was there. And yet, as I got my bag and I was walking out, I saw President Nelson. He was a young apostle at the time. But I saw him coming into the airport with some members of his family. And, you know, at the time, I didn't see apostles every day. That was kind of exciting for me. So I stood back, and I'm watching President Nelson go by, and he must have just sensed me geeking at him, you know? <laughs> he must have just saw me just yeah. staring at him because he kind of stopped and looked over at me, and I said, God bless you, Elder Nelson, for the good that you do. God bless you. And he said, thank you. And then he turns, starts catching up to his family, and there were some businessmen who were walking out, and just as they, they were laughing and shoving each other, and just as they passed Elder Nelson, they said some of the foulest words you can even imagine. Huh. And I thought, they have no idea. They're walking by an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they have no idea. And I thought, you know, God love Kenny Rogers, but how important is he to my eternal salvation when compared yeah. to an apostle who can go through the airport and not even be recognized? Mm -hmm. That's a crazy confluence of events. It <laughs> was, really. Yeah, that was divinely orchestrated. And, that. and it made me stop and realize, look, we've got to, we've got to focus on heaven's uh, first string, heaven's superstars. We've got to focus on those that heaven has called to represent Christ to us. You know, I, people see apostles and stuff, and they feel like they're seeing a celebrity, but it's different because they're not celebrities to us. They're part of our testimonies. The reason we love the sisters and the brothers that lead the church is because they are witnesses, and their witness joins our witness in having faith, which is what Christ asks in that first beatitude. Blessed are ye. Um, happy are ye, exalted are ye, yeah. holy are ye, if ye will have faith in me and those that I have called to represent me. And I would say the rock stars in heaven are the moms crying at the kitchen table, yeah. the bishops that are willing to testify to a teenager, right? The, the grocery store clerk that is always kind and patient, you know? I agree and, with you. I and agree a with President you. Nelson, and, who has given his yes. life. Yeah. And general leaders that 
that are willing to sacrifice and their families that are yeah. willing to sacrifice for their stewardships, yeah. for sure. Well, and speaking the economy this, of heaven, right? Right. And speaking to the same principle of, you know, supporting the brethren and connecting that with faith, mm -hmm. uh, Doctrine and Covenants, right, teaches us, right? Like follow, you know, Joseph at the time, but we substitute our current prophet in there, but follow him with all faith and patience. And, and I, I just love how uh, this opportunity we have, uh, I was thinking of, you talked about your bishop. For me, it was a stake president who gave me some, at the time, hard counsel. And I remember I was like, uh, well, I was wanting to change as a young 18 year old, right? And I thought I should just change by going this way. But he was like, uh, and he said, this is what you need for changing, right? Like, I think he could discern, obviously, sort of what attributes I like the most. And poor in spirit, humility, yeah, that wasn't exist, it did not exist in me at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it was so hard for me to follow that counsel. But when I just had, I had to finally just humble myself, follow it in faith. That, that's the decision that determined the trajectory for the rest of my life, so. And you said, you know, in a world where faith is not talked about, mm -hmm. then we need to be able to be bold. Um, Elder Anderson said several general conferences ago that we're at a tipping point, that there will be more people leaving Christianity over the next decade than those who will enter Christianity. And Christianity has always been a growing faith. Yeah. But we're at a point, but I loved how he said, as the world speaks less of him, we will speak more of him. What's the name of this show? Talk, Talk of him. Talk of Thanks him. Thanks for the plug, Brother Brad. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I love that because yeah. we're talking of him. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, that uh, you know, that's, we can't go wrong if we're standing with him, if we're standing with his, his prophets, if we're standing with his leaders. And I think it was also Elder Anderson, I, correct me, if I'm wrong on this, that said in conference that we will need to link arms with other believers of other faiths because we're, we're going to need what yeah. those that are willing to follow Jesus within their yeah. belief S systems yeah. and and support each other as as the prophet Joseph Smith always spoke to that defending the Catholic and the Methodist and the Baptist right that we need each other of faith and when we do interfaith work. I think it's so powerful when we when we support each other in that journey. And that, and that just the fact that we're willing to have faith in this world mm -hmm. right now, where faith is on the outs, it unpopular. really... Unpopular. Yeah. Unpopular. And, and is what I look for in popularity, which caused the whole problem. Yeah. So popularity is not the answer, I can guarantee you. The but just to be able to have that faith and to be able to link with others who are willing to have that faith in this time, that bonds us. Yeah. That bonds us. I'd love to ask what, what you share in chapter 10 of the book about, you know, consecrating the persecution, the opposition that we all face in mortality. Can you share maybe each of you a time where you have faced some opposition or heartbreak and you feel like maybe it's looking back that it was consecrated for your good and how you learn to connect with Christ. I mean, our viewers will see that I'm currently going through. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't know anything about <laughs> opposition, do you? <laughs> and, and literally just in the last few weeks, just this experience of, of shattering my arm yeah. and, and allowing that literal break to help me find a connection with Christ has, has I would never want to cause more pain for myself, yeah. but but life has a way of presenting, and both of you have written about it in the book. But can maybe we have a conversation around where specifically you see that 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 opposition and that heartbreak has been consecrated for your good? Brad, can I go first? On sure. That? Okay. Um, going back to that story, I was so happy that Sunday, having reunited with my family um, and my parents reconciling, if you will. I was just over the, the moon. It was wonderful. And um, the next day, Monday, getting up, short hair now, 
going to school. Still going to school. And here we um, go. Rubber meets the road, right? Here I am walking into the hangouts, the other things, right. meeting my 10, 15, whatever friends that are did not change, if you will. And um, when they when I said I don't do that anymore and I'm not gonna you know, and that kind of thing, I was actually feeling that they would be excited for me in mm. my discovery. Like support. My revelations, my changing. Yeah. But they weren't. Here were friends that I thought would be friends to the bitter end. Um, friends that I would die for, if you will. You know, I, I thought that of them, that we were that close. But um, as soon as I said, I don't do that anymore, oh boy, talk about persecution, talk about opposition. I received a whole bunch of it in, in that they would not let me go easily from their group. And, um, and for me, I looked at it at the time, you know, because the whole reason I'd started it was for popularity and friendship. And then to leave that voluntarily, knowing that that was not the answer for me with those friends doing those things. But I, years later, you know, well, from that point on, but a year or two later, I find myself in the mission field. And I find myself receiving opposition. I got called to Germany. Almost, yeah, <clears throat> I served in Germany. And, and that's not an easy place to serve. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a lot of opposition, but I found myself dealing with it much better. I, yeah. Like you had the spiritual muscles. Yeah, there you go. That, I like that. The yeah. spiritual muscle to deal with it yeah. because I already had mm -hmm. dealt with it with those friends and with the, the rejection and the other things that were going on. And I learned to stand on my own feet. I, I learned to not, well, as Lehi does in the, in the vision, uh, looking at the great and spacious building where he says, I heed them not. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned to do that. Yeah. Where before I partake of the fruit, but no, I, I really cared about what they thought and what they were thinking. And I even you wanted to tra travel over there. But now, uh-uh, the fruit was yeah. it. And I heeded them not. And all I cared about were my loved ones and family and, and others. And so it really did, uh, even though, and, and I'm not saying you have to leave the path to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. In my case, it made me strong. Your weak space um, became your strength. Right, because I, I, I knew what the other side was. And now, oh boy, I want to stay here. Well, I, I love how you just connected your earlier experience uh, with the bishop. And remember when he was like, what you need most is to know how much God loves you. And you just connect that to the vision and the fruit, which is the, the love, love of, of God. God. And it can that can take on so many meanings. But just the potential transformative power of an individual who experiences authentically and genuinely and deeply and personally how much God loves them, I'm a witness of the transformative power of that. Yeah. It, it, it really does almost just wipe out the desire it, it and, does. And of that previous popularity and things that used to allure you. It's just like, <laughs> um, yeah, no. No. This yeah. is, I've, I've actually, I have the I've real I've tasted thing, the true I, fruit. I can't, there's yeah. no going back. Yeah. To, now, but to, Christ himself says <clears throat> throughout the scriptures, not if you have persecution, you will you have will. persecution. Right, right. And even President Nelson has said, you will have persecution, and it can either you know, crush you, mm. or it can motivate you, and it can strengthen you. And so I think what's interesting for me to hear as Rogers talks about that is that you, your, the persecution you faced prepared you for more persecution. We're kind of unique as Latter-day Saints in that heaven isn't a rest home. <laughs> you know, heaven isn't this great place where we're going to just smell flowers all day and the cloud yeah. playing the harp. We're, we're going to we, keep learning. We're very unique in that we believe that we're going to face persecution 
throughout the rest of eternity, because wherever there is agency, there will always be those who choose mm, great. to not follow along. Wherever there's light, there there's will dark. Be opposition. And so there yeah. will always be and opposition. Usually with opposition yeah. comes persecution. So And right. so, you know, it's crazy to think that maybe through persecution, even though it's hard, like your broken arm, um, it's it's a way that God's preparing us. For us, heaven isn't going to be uh, eternity with no opposition. It's going to be an eternity of love and growth despite opposition. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at a quick example, um, going back to the pre-mortal realm, Lucifer, uh, all the things that were going on with that, the things that he and the followers were doing in rebellion to God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son was extreme persecution, mm. lying, accusing, accusing, right there in the book of Revelations. Right. It, there's extreme opposition, and yet they're eternal beings. Right. Here's the Father receiving persecution from his rebellious children. Right. Wow. And and he's exalted. Yeah. And so somewhere he learned how it's to really deal with that's that. A, that's expansive. Yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. And when while we don't know much about it, but the scriptures do indicate that again toward the end of the millennium there's more of this wow. rebellion, you know, and, and what that looks like. But right, it shouldn't surprise us. This is an eternal reality. Yeah. Light and dark. Yeah, we we shouldn't expect that, oh, it's just going to be mortality right. or whatever. That's great. These attributes are divine or meant to be a divine or an eternal or beyond this life kind of growth. Yeah. I awesome. pulled this out of my pocket because Roger and I are both teachers. And this is a statement from President Boyd K. Packer that has always been meaningful to us. He says, somewhere on earth in our day, our youth must, positively must, be able to tie to someone who is not confused and who is secure in his faith. Somebody has to stand, face the storm, declare the truth, and let the winds blow, and be serene and composed and steady in the doing of it. That is your responsibility and your obligation as teachers. At the beginning of every semester, I read this to my students and I say, I take this very personally. But on the topic that we are talking about now, you cannot stand, face the storm, declare the truth, and let the wind blow, and be serene and composed in the steady of, and, of, and steady in the doing of it without facing opposition. I mean, you cannot take it's an, it's this inherent. stand yeah. without people coming the, against the you. The spiritual muscles that you were talking yeah. about. Because that opposition will stand. That storm is going to blow. Yeah. And as you stand for truth, it's going to be something that people get very riled up about. And so it's... Uh, it's it's hard, it's hurtful, it's hurtful. I mean, some of the things that students have said about me and my teacher evaluations, whoa. I mean, maybe all your students loved you. No, but just 99%. My... <laughs> A couple didn't, but most of them. <laughs> but you know, you, you see some of the things that, that people will say about you just because you're teaching a truth. I mean, I had a girl get so mad at me just because I bore testimony that this is the only true church. Oh, she was furious. How can you be so exclusive? How can you just say that? That is so... And, and I said, look, I'm teaching at BYU. If there's ever a place where I have the right to testify of this, it's right here. And yet she was so offended by that and she felt like I was being so unfair and so critical and so judgmental. And she 
called me fat. Now, who would ever call a Wilcox fat? I she just didn't don't understand. She did not that. call so you fat. <laughs> a little bit here. Did she really? A oh, she called me fat. She <laughs> called me stupid. She called me, you know, ignorant. And <laughs> she so called sad. me self-righteous. And she, I mean, the names can go on and on and on. And, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, that can hurt. It can hurt. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, I pull out Elder Packer's quote, yeah. and I remember, this is my responsibility. This is my obligation as a teacher. And so despite it all, I'll stand with Christ, who said, yeah, they're going to persecute you, but they persecuted me first. And as long as we're standing with Christ, then we can heed them not, as yeah. Elder Bednar talked about. We can heed them not. The only one that matters is the Lord. That's right. That's awesome. That's a perfect place I to agree. start. I agree. Thank you for doing that. Thank yeah. you. I noticed you reached out with this arm <laughs> and not the other arm. <laughs> and and I've, I've felt the spirit and the vulnerability, and I've learned things and just having this conversation, and I'm so grateful you've taken your life experiences and work together to put them in, in book form. Yeah, yeah, the book one more time. Because it lives on pages. Blessed are ye. Look and I love it. that cover. It yeah. turned out great. Good job. See, I'm so happy I'm so about glad. it. so glad we're, we're the ones to show it to yes. you. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be beautiful. Wrap it up? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Brad. Thank you to Roger. Thanks for tuning in. We hope that you found something in our episode today that helps you draw closer to Jesus Christ. And hopefully, specifically as it pertains to the Beatitudes found in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, we hope that you're able to utilize these beautiful guideposts and directions from the Savior to find Him and experience Him and His love more in your life. Thank you for joining us on Talk of Him, and we'll see you next time. Talk of Him is brought to you by Covenant Communications. Make sure you follow us on social media and pick up a copy of Find Him Study Guide at Siegel Book or online.